Ostatni panel dziś poświęcony będzie Our last panel uh, will once again be an encounter between an artist and a critic, a uh, cultural studies scholar. And now our interlocutors will be is Iwona Kuzza, PhD, who teaches at the Institute of Polish Culture at Warsaw University. And she runs the uh, Department of uh, Film and Audiovisual Culture. She's written a book, Faces in the Crowd. And in the other corner is uh, Wojciech uh, Wilczyk, an outstanding documentary uh, photographer whom I'm sure you know uh, best from his latest uh, series, There's No Such Thing as the Innocent Eye, where Wojtek documented former or the architecture, which had uh, previously been um, Jewish sacred uh, architecture in Poland, former synagogues, basically. It was a very ambitious project uh, with a great spread and it had a lot of um, impact, but now it's over to the panelists. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Why don't I begin? We, Wojtek and I uh, did not uh, discuss what we'd be saying beforehand, so this might come as a surprise to uh, both of us. What we did define was a certain frame a frame whereby we'd be talking about a number of uh, photographic uh, projects that uh, Wojtek Wilczyk did. And we'd be talking around on the, we'd be speaking to the concept of the archive and documentary photography. And uh, on a side note, these projects, even though however different they are and different their strategies, they uh, use a different departure point to consider what an archive and what a documentary photography can be in a given situation that I might uh, define. I won't be original here, I, but I would call this as a bipolar disease or the uh, archive illness disease. Um, and this was, uh, this cropped up a number of times today. Uh, on the one hand, we have order. On the one hand, we have classification and so on. On the other hand, we have entropy. We have the um, decomposition of the archive from within, the uh, decomposition of um, the archive, as uh, described by Morrison. And then there's the uh, social and political context that uh, contributes to the devastation of archives, erosion of archives, uh, especially visible in Central and Eastern Europe. And the organizers have uh, pointed this out. A post-socialist Central Europe, which is still facing the need to work through its 20th century history. And uh, we're working. We have this obsession with memory and memory work. And the archives of which we have uh, too many, which we would gladly be rid of, which we rediscover which we create, which on the one hand, uh, we are not reliable, others are given too much credence, and uh, there is the, um, so we're bouncing back and forth, uh, if you will, and uh, as I said, there is this uh, risk of a bipolar uh, disease, which it's difficult to free oneself from. And when I was uh, thinking about the Wojtek Wilczyk's uh, photography projects, it uh, became obvious to me that we should start looking or considering the category of time as the archive is by definition, archives are by definition anachronistic, by which I mean institutions that either, we believe, reach back into the past and contains records and uh, testimonies of the past, or is uh, created with the future in mind. There are archives uh, which are designed for posterity. When we take somebody's uh, fingerprints, it's uh, because we believe that one day these uh, fingerprints will come in handy to the law enforcement authorities. So archives are somehow incapable of uh, capturing the uh, here and the now, and that's also 
anachronistic. And whenever we smile to the camera, we sin against uh, photography in a basic sense because we're smiling not because we're happy now but we want uh, to be happy when looking at these uh, photos in the future so there is this uh, timelessness and uh, that's uh, dangerous for archive and documentary photography and when uh, thinking about Wojtek's uh, projects I wondered how this trap how this pitfall can be transcended avoided um, in order to not to lapse into errors or the risks inherent in the various uh, uses of existing archives where on the one hand we risk creating a freak show as a curio cabinet um, a catalog of uh, curios precisely and on the other hand uh, there's the risk the obvious uh, risk that in existing archives we search for evidence to uh, confirm uh, preconceived ideas and this is the way the excellent f photographic archives are used or the archives of the Warsaw Uprising and that's also an example of what's been said could you tell her to speak a little closer to the microphone and um, this, uh, the archives, these uh, photographs are available, and this availability accessibility, uh, thanks to a digital database, represents an alibi or gives uh, legitim legitim legitimizes. And when we have uh, five or six uh, photographs uh, staged, uh, which uh, conform to a given narrative, on the other hand, we have the risk of uh, falling into sentimentalism. And I'm a little oversensitive to that, uh, I'm a little tuned to that. So it's like a cheap uh, reading of Bart. We believe that when staring at the uh, photo long enough, we'll get back into the time past, uh, see into the souls or at least the um, faces of the uh, people in the photograph uh, hoping for some sort of epiphany. And I don't know if uh, Wojtek Wilczek would like to say something uh, here and how this applies uh, to your project. So uh, at this time, I would like to say that I never wanted, I never felt like doing projects that would be pleasant to look at in the future. And what's being shown here, these are photos from my first major project on industrial sites of Upper Silesia. This is an industrial basin in southern Poland. Basically, it's the Rust Belt. And uh, it was this was done between 99 and 2003. I was, it's a visual inspiration. The formal visual inspiration came from archives because a seminal a uh, moment uh, for this series of photographs uh, came uh, from um, U.S. Uh, photos from the 30s and 40s, American photos uh, from the archive, currently in the Library of Congress, from the uh, Farm Security Administration archive, and partly from a project that was also headed by Roy Emerson Strecker, a project done the standard oil project as part of which the day-to-day -day life in the states uh, during the war was photographed and after the war and as well and uh, at now the most inspiring uh, photographs that allowed me to take a different look at uh, upper silesia were photographs by todd webb uh, made in 48 in Pittsburgh, also an industrial city uh, called Steel City or Smoky Town, a, um, where the a lot of pollution, uh, steel mills, steel works and so on in hilly country, moreover. And uh, Todd Webb's uh, photos got me thinking in certain categories in terms of Sort of got me thinking about Upper Silesia in a certain way. And where did this uh, lead me to? Well, looking back with hindsight at these uh, photos, I see that the convention of imaging that I applied here, which was back in the day natural, certain, and incontrovertible, somehow uh, restricted, confined the thematic content of this uh, 
series. Uh, ten years ago in Upper Silesia, these industrial facilities were being shut down and uh, demolished, which uh, led to uh, collective layoffs, changing the financial status and position of a lot of the local people. And that's uh, something I failed to photograph. I just uh, photographed the uh, symptoms as visible in the urban landscape, in the cityscape. And I understand that the reason you did that had to do with the limitations stemming from the aesthetic inspiration that you adopted. I believe so. The decision that seemed straightforward and um, at the time to work in black and white, uh, which makes the visual statement less transparent than it would be if I had used color. And second, it also curtails, limits the thematic scope, or the thematic scope is slightly different, and there's other things, uh, there is activity. Are we trying to aestheticize, monumentalize the landscape here instead? And uh, perhaps uh, I could have focused more on um, social matters uh, that were fairly dire uh, in the time at the time, which I, and I didn't do that. I won't argue, I won't deny that. This was an example uh, of a project in which the surface perhaps overshadowed, uh, by the surface I uh, mean the aesthetic convention, the surface overshadowed uh, something, other things that might have been shown. But here I'd uh, refer or invoke, I mean the archive is a very broad concept and topic, but I think that this uh, project like uh, Life After Life, another project, and no such thing as the innocent eye, uh, could be subsumed within the category of archiving, namely stock taking inventory. So the sense that we can take stock, we can uh, do a, a list, uh, compile a list of uh, things as they are, um, the present situation. and. Uh, if this is well rooted, well established, various aporias, various uh, contradictions, if uh, somebody prefers that word, uh, of the archive or uh, of our approach to archive might have been avoided or transcended. And uh, let me just, when looking at these uh, photos earlier, I always uh, have this uh, nagging suspicion of uh, how they affect the viewer because they're pretty photographs. Even I mean, they're good photographs, even if the landscape is fairly gloomy, decrepit, dilapidated, um, and but the uh, the convention does lead to a certain nostalgia. It leads. As I said, there's a certain falsification of time because this is not the here and now. This is all of a sudden a ruin. This is uh, a generalized, uh, a generic, uh, fading landscape. Uh, uh, and there's a tension uh, between the uh, concrete, the specific, the local, and something that could undergo um, metaphorization. It, there's a shift. Yeah, I think it does. Refer to project. Refer back to uh, earlier black and white uh, projects made uh, 20, 30 years ago. But on this uh, stock taking, I what I did back then, uh, consciously or less so, was an attempt at taking stock, at compiling a register. But after publishing the book, after completing the project, I realized how important it was to take this project and the uh, coherent, consistent statement or to make it a purely auteur uh, in nature. And so this uh, series of uh, photos you're looking at is uh, com corresponds in terms of the order to the uh, order in which the photographs were placed in the book called Black and White Silesia, but the actual arrangement of the photos uh, was uh, defined by the editor as much as by myself. It was a compromise. So uh, later on, I realized that the arrangement, the deployment, must be uh, my own because I feel that this entire statement has uh, moved uh, a little towards the metaphorical 
this uh, stock taking uh, nature was uh, somehow uh, weakened, eroded. I could have found a way of um, doing that better. But uh, given the way I thought at the time, given my approach to uh, the way such a statement could be organized, I did what I could. But now, of course, I'd do it differently and the photos would be in a different sequence. And uh, just let me ask, it's not only due to the uh, use of uh, the black and white uh, convention. So one could imagine, actually, that the black and white texture would be untransparent. Well, again, that depends on the intention, that depends on your strategy, the strategy of your statement, but definitely a black and white in this case uh, was a limitation, limited the scope, breadth of the uh, statement, and I think it would be a lot more interesting if I had used uh, color as well. And in fact, uh, there was a time when I was shooting the uh, ruins of a coking plant and uh, I used uh, filters, uh, yellow, uh, orange, and so on. And when I removed the uh, filter from the lens, and I saw in the light of the setting sun this uh, ruined uh, coke and plant, which was entirely yellow, and I realized I was uh, losing something by having chosen black and white. And for the viewer, it's also the uh, way they respond, the way they uh, see the photograph will depend on certain ingrained habits. Mm, so it's cognitive, it uh, helps you when it overcomes a certain uh, habits, but then again, sometimes we want transparency, we don't want to see the uh, formal devices. Uh, formal devices are always uh, present when color, perhaps they're more evident, but uh, using the right strategy, of course, uh, they're somehow hidden, they're less uh, visible at first glance. Of course, these devices always exist with black and white, they're perhaps more evident, or mm, maybe it's just a convention that's more uh, familiar in our visual culture. And there's, it's also in uh, the context of various uh, records or chronicles, annals, where we have, when we have uh, color photographs from World War II, and uh, that's uh, so not obvious that so it's not and that that uh, provides uh, different meanings and it's also a matter of a choice for anybody who wants to reconstruct or reenact uh, who wants to refer to various uh, forms of uh, recording in black and white or color and i understand that this experience led you towards a uh, styleless photography I'm referring to a discussion that we had here about photography, about Wojtek Wilczek's uh, photography, where one of the accusations uh, uh, made against uh, his next or later projects uh, is that what? The photographer has failed to find a style of his own. Well, yes, uh, the critic who wrote that, actually, and it was a uh, text on the uh, There is No Such Thing as the Innocent Eye project, where I photographed all the former uh, synagogues, uh, prayer houses, and uh, religious uh, schools, and Jewish religious schools that were deconsecrated, that are not, no longer have a ritual function. It uh, was about and then the critic or the author of the text uh, mentioned uh, photographers who developed, who have developed a style of their own as opposed to myself. So let's take a look at the uh, photos. Uh, yeah, and uh, even before we show this uh, project, no such thing as the innocent eye, it's the matter, it's a decision, a decision which uh, has to do with the entire strategy. Or maybe not. Maybe let's uh, take a look at the uh, photos first. There's no such thing as the innocent eye. I'll run the slideshow and... Uh, or maybe... There's a lot of photographs, so... I'll just loop them. When working on this, when beginning this uh, project, uh, frankly, I intended, originally intended to do these uh, photographs in black and white. 
because when I thought about this project, I thought that black and white would best be suited, would uh, help me bring out the nature of these buildings, their shape, their form. But at the same, but then again, black and white would also enable me to eliminate all the contemporary um, aspects. And I soon realized that this was uh, the wrong way to go about it. I realized this when comparing the exposed uh, film with the scanned uh, black and white uh, photographs with uh, what I remembered. I realized that all these um, contemporary additions, attributes, that the mess, the disorder, was very relevant uh, here, in fact, and that all these uh, sites, all these buildings need to be shown in their present-day environment and not shy away from that. This was an important part of the statement. I would agree that it is an important part of the statement for a number of reasons, because well, it's obvious, and uh, you see this in the photographs, it just jumps out at you. Uh, so we see the uh, beauty of uh, Polish small towns. The, the, we see what Polish uh, small towns uh, look like, the uh, spaces, the sites in which uh, former Jewish uh, religious uh, schools, uh, synagogues, and prayer houses exist as remodeled, readapted, and uh, we see Actually, all of these are different. And um, then there was also the thing, the fact that this uh, project, that uh, when this project was being developed, it wasn't initially all planned out. I changed uh, my premises, my assumptions. I never wanted to, I didn't start out wanting to photograph all the buildings. Uh, this came to me later on as I was doing these, as I was shooting these uh, synagogues as I realized how different, how diverse their form is, and how often, how greatly they were remodeled, and their facades, because I photographed uh, the buildings uh, only from the outside, were stripped of anything that would um, suggest that this was a, a place of worship of any kind. And um, at first, I also wanted to be more rigorous in the way I showed these uh, buildings. I thought about making, drawing up a quasi-typology where I'd have just the facades of these uh, buildings, but the uh, nature of the material here uh, forced me to be more flexible because, as you can see, your as you can see, the uh, location of these uh, buildings is uh, very different, as is their form. And so attempts at uh, drawing up a visual typology wherein I would show the common features, the similarities, were doomed from the start. And and uh, adopting such a rigorous approach, uh, shooting simply from the front, uh, front wall. This would dilute the uh, context in which the buildings exist, and uh, this is something I started caring about at some point. And uh, so, uh, the approach to uh, showing the approach to this uh, subject uh, was, in a sense, uh, forced, or I was, in a sense, uh, modified, or my initial assumptions were modified due to the nature of the buildings themselves. And in the text that you referred to, uh, it said it also said something about how uh, these are different types of light, uh, different seasons. And this was a uh, per, uh, intentional. This was intentional because to photograph 307 buildings, I had to tour. Uh, I had to uh, travel thousands of miles all across the country and shoot in various uh, conditions, various lighting conditions and so on. And I tried for these buildings that I, for the buildings uh, to be somehow visually appealing. 
but I never intended to make them aesthetic, to embellish them by visual appeal. Visual appeal is a series of uh, features uh, which make a photo interesting for the potential viewers. So even though this uh, series is a checklist of um, these uh, buildings, I wanted it to be interesting for viewers who would be going over this extensive uh, set of 300 photographs. It does seem to me that it is hugely interesting for a variety of reasons. On the one hand, uh, we, well, we do not see the caption, but we know uh, what that is, beauty shops, churches, and so on and so forth. There are, these are institutions that have been located in buildings abandoned by Jewish communities. But a number of shifts have taken place because uh, from what we have seen, there has been a change in the decision from color to black and white. And the actual gravity has been uh, in the local context. We have said that the uh, change of the decision t in terms of using the material, it changes the profile of the picture as well. Because uh, those pictures don't tell us that this is a synagogue. They tell us this is a building that used to house a synagogue. So the um, sentence itself is totally different also from the viewpoint of consequences to the viewer. I can uh, recall a movie by Yanta Teleska Pauline um, in the first couple of sequ sequences we see houses that we could assume had been inhabited by Jews prior to the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, empty door frames, empty window frames are calling to their old inhabitants. So, uh, well, that is obviously a certain choice of the author that I interpret in a specific way, and that is one of the final consequences uh, concerning the color and the context. Well, in terms of the buildings calling to their inhabitants, I can definitely declare that, well, those buildings are not calling out. Nevertheless, in the majority of buildings, uh, with regard to their environment, the environment of those buildings, well, the immediate environment of those buildings all throughout Poland, well, all around them we have a sense of uninhabitants and emptiness after the Holocaust, uh, when those houses were emptied. Well, all these locations and all those locations feature, well, have come to a standstill and are very quiet. And that also, re that also ties in with another aspect of the project because uh, ever since my early childhood, ever since I decided to photograph synagogues, I did have a sense of emptiness. Uh, there is a district called Dompniki, and actually those objects uh, were signs to me. I had been very much aware that something had happened there, and actually I could not really read the signs. I didn't know what, was the, th what the thing was all about. I had been uh, traveling around Poland and taking a closer look at different locations throughout the country. Obviously, later on, I found them in the neighborhood of buildings uh, that I began to photograph as part of my project. The, the response was very simple. And at this point, well, with regard to the project, uh, that had been described by Ivona as a type of inventory. It is a very important matter, and it relates to the uh, issue of uh, setting up an archival collection. 
After half a year of photographing synagogues, once I had 100 objects photographed, and I must say, had say, I must say that I had been coming back to many of them. Well, I believe that they were very satisfactory to me. I must say that I came across a reply as to how to organize that material in the form of a published collection in order to avoid the manipulation of material that ought to form part of the archival collection, something that Alan Sekula had also described. I am always trying to bring every project to an end, to a final publication. So taking a closer look at those objects and those photographs that have a variety of contexts, I am asking myself how to organize that. And the reply was very simple, as it turned out. And it ties in with the uh, task of inventorizing the collection. I have simply understood that since I decided to photograph all these buildings, that the best form imaginable to present the material uh, would be to uh, publish a book that would be a lexicon, that is a diversity involving a diversity of visual material that would be arranged cr alphabetically. And this is exactly what uh, has been put together in the form of the book entitled There is No Such Thing as in the Innocent Eye. So I understood what inventorizing was uh, all about. This is mainly an art project or an artistic project. Nevertheless, each and every single photograph will have to be commented on, obviously to the extent enabling by sources, by, by available sources. Therefore, the uh, book that has been published, now the second edition, of the book has been published. The book published uh, on occasion of that particular project has been uh, structured in a specific way. All the photographs are arranged alphabetically, whereas the photograph on the right is always accompanied by a caption of the left. So no, no building is anonymous. They are all described also in terms of their, their architectonic style that you are not always capable of noticing at once. So this is uh, a way of photographing an archival collection. I believe that this is a very efficient move. I do believe, sometimes I feel as its victim because I had been aware of the project from press um, comments. So it was quite obvious that I had learned about the project on the basis of photographs specifically chosen. I. I took a took the book. Uh, it begins with A for Augustov. Augustov being a time, time a town in Poland. I said, okay, but what's Jewish about this architecture? I can't see it. And uh, I do have the impression that this project uh, definitely launches certain processes, which are to a certain extent analogous in terms of the uh, visual analogy to what we regrettably know in the Polish history, i.e., we are absolutely capable of uh, recognizing Jewishness, recognizing a Jew, and that leads to a certain visibility or appearance of whatever is Jewish. And uh, the project obviously involves certain visibility because those architectonic features have been retained. Sometimes uh, walls have been used as part of a different building. Nevertheless, this project shows the same project in a variety of ways. In the same, um, on the one hand, we have a certain subcutaneous sense of uh, willing to notice the stranger, the alien, the other. Whereas on the other hand, The uh, recognition that you have made possible for us enables something totally different. It simply shows us that the architectonic reality, the architectonic past, has been assimilated. Yes, it has been assimilated. We have finally assimilated 
Jewish culture. And I do believe that it is not, uh, there is nothing ambiguous, uh, ambiguous about it. Uh, it has become more of an appropriation rather than assimilation. Some signs have been or some marks have been retained. I know that it is not that simple. We have an extra context here because this is accompanied by um, a record of your conversations with the locals because uh, people were sometimes suspicious when in contact with a guy who wanted to photograph the property of former Jewish communities. So we have a double move here. We do have some kind of uh, suspicion to another culture, to the Jewishness. But on the other hand, definitely you have captured the assimilation or the absorption of our reality or of their reality by ours, given the practices of provincial Poland. Definitely, but uh, obviously after a number of months of photography and after having seen 100 such buildings, I, it became much easier for me to notice those that had been overstructured because uh, the um, synagogue architect architecture had been subject to very specific rules. Nevertheless, despite the process of assimilation that had been apparent, it was quite easy to verify it. Um, the thesis asking some of the uh, locals, because everyone knows which buildings had been owned by whom, and that does not only go for synagogues, and that does not only apply to um, the generation who had been contemporaries of Polish Jews, but also to generations born after World War II, uh, which came to me as quite a surprise. I remember in the retrieval when uh, the, um, well, actually that conversation had not been made part of the book. So in the retrieval in Wielkopolska, which happens to be the Poznań district, uh, when I began preparing to uh, photograph the synagogue building, a ground floor window opened and a lady asked me, okay, ah, uh, 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 the lady said, you're photographing the synagogue. And I said, yes, are you going to photograph the German, bird, the German building next to it as well? And I said, no. So actually people are aware of what had been going on and assimilation had only taken place with regard to the form of the building. So there had been a variety of functions to those buildings, uh, sacral functions included. Now what Ivona had said is also true as well. It had become apparent in the course of this project in a rather natural manner. I had not planned to take such action. Uh, simply put, uh, when I had been taking photographs, people were taking, excuse me, people were asking me what I'm doing. Sometimes the conversations were broader. Some people had mentioned stereotypes um, originating or well taken directly out from the press of the 20s of the last century. And after a couple of conversations of the kind, I realized that I am witness to marvelous material that would in turn become a fascinating complement to what I had been uh, doing in terms of photographing the uh, synagogues. And actually, I, the um, initiative had always been that of my interlocutor. Uh, obviously, um, some comments are anti-Semitic, but not all of them. Some of them are neutral, some of them are comical. Uh, some of them, well, in a couple of situations, uh, uh, people are ab absolutely, uh, absolutely um, disgusted by the fact that those synagogues had been devastated or damaged. And obviously there were stereotypes that I encountered. 
Um, therefore, I can definitely say that those were very fa they were fascinating, magnificent additions or additives. I had not recorded them. I had simply made notes. Uh, I believe that should I, had I used a dictaphone, uh, people would have stopped talking altogether or they would have said something entirely different. So I simply edited those comments in a format that would be reminiscent of a press reportage. Um, this is definitely an artistic project, and this is exactly why I thought that such a format would be appropriate. Well, that is a process as part of which the artist, that is you, um, embarks on an archival search. You had emphasized uh, it many times that the time it took to put the project together definitely required archival, archival searches and archival research. You needed to find the buildings before you started searching in field. And one of the purposes was to teach us how to look. But thanks to the fact that we do not have any over aesthetization, and also it is very important that you have managed to shift or reconstruct on the base of that project, well, uh, from the aesthetics to, the, to cognition. And that, I believe, is a question to us as the recipients of the project. So what will that project leave us with? This is also why I am not really fond of nostalgia, because so uh, that definitely makes us or sets us in a position of an entity that is self-deprecatory, um, and it is an auto-sentiment. So, uh, or self-sentimental, um, we have now let the second tier fall, as Kundera had it. Well, the Jews were there, now they're not. The synagogues are a thing of the past, and thing, people believe that that's it. But uh, this is something that we should definitely uh, focus on. So uh, this is a uh, synagogue building. Uh, well, d the question arises whether we should do something about it or we shall do something about it. And this is only about a, the, um, a very conscious look, a very conscious issue. So uh, that project, that issue, it goes beyond the, uh, the uh, that goes beyond a simple memory. In with regard to the uh, with regard to the representation of the style in the visual sense, in case of documentation, in case of documentary photographs, I believe that it is much more important um, it, much more important than the simple set of features. It is a very important to emphasize the procedure. That is the selection of appropriate equipment, uh, uh, the middle-sized picture, which definitely ensures mobility and rapidity of action. Obviously, the question of processing was important. The choice of perspective was important. Um, the issue of presenting the, uh, the project, the question of the weather was important, the question of using light. And uh, that strategy has to be very consistent. I do believe that it is going to be very successful in of individualizing the uh, whole project. Uh, so definitely, we do see certain aspects in the visual aspect, and that involves the fact that it is uh, that not every topic can involve that. And uh, you remember Bogdan Konopka, who 
in this, actually during the same period or actually before, uh, he's began taking photographs and he put together a major project, a major photographic project that um, focused on Jewish cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries uh, in a specific format. And the title of the cycle was very, very interesting because um, it was uh, well, that is not any, uh, and the title had not been any surprise, not, not really been surprising in case of Bogdan Konopka because when he, uh, when he uh, uh, photographed Paris, uh, he um, dubbed that uh, gray, uh, the gray Paris, and when he had been photographing uh, China, he dubbed that particular cycle uh, the gray empire. But on the semantic side, the title is extremely capacious, and it. Uh, is absolutely juxtaposed in comparison or in on confrontation with what we can see on the photographs. Bogdan Konopka is very consistently mm, monochromatic and uh, he only uh, uses the uh, large format and um, a simulacrum half tones. So this is exactly why he had been able to portrait uh, Jewish cemeteries. And I myself, I'm trying to show uh, Jewish cemeteries on the aesthetic side or the aestheticizing side. And as part of the gray memory, we had only been exposed uh, to pictures and images from cemeteries uh, where everything is ivy covered, where the um, light is being sifted through the uh, trees growing there, and so on and so forth. And the strategy of, of proceeding, the uh, process of aesthetizing, and the uh, with little attention paid to the um, scale of half tones and the beauty, well, it had resulted in a specific uh, situation, specific set of circumstances. For example, I had not photographed uh, the cemetery in Radziwowo, whether it happens to be a, a landfill, also in Bauti, for example, in Woods, uh, there is an, um, in Bauti, in Woods, there is also a, uh, the uh, cemetery is not, excuse me, the scenery is not very attractive. Also in another location, there are, uh, there is a cemetery next to a, uh, next to the, a, a football pitch. Um, so th the concept adopted by the author of Grey Memory had actually disabled him to present the phenomenon in a broader context or in a broader dimension. Nevertheless, all the locations that I had just mentioned could definitely could have found their way into the so-called Grey Memory Project, and I am not ironic in declaring that. I do know uh, that the there is no such thing as an innocent eye project is also an analogy to what you're working on now or a bridge to what you're, on, what you're way, uh, working on now. So let me now mention the gray memory. Let me tell you what it is all about. I do not wish to, to, to close that presentation. So Krzysztof, could you please help me? So that is a, those are photographs of the kind you see here. I apologize for the in slight interruption. So the, um, unfortunately, the, uh, quality is, is as it is. I had simply downloaded those photographs. But from my own experience, I do know that uh, um, in case of phot photographing synagogues, I had uh, taken a stroll to nearby locations. And my own experience tells me that, unfortunately, those are uh, places which are usually covered with garbage, uh, local drunks. Uh, come to have a drink there and they uh, leave their empties, be it cans or be it bottles. Uh, 
and that is uh, and that is uh, it. Uh, I believe that the convention applied here had actually excluded the uh, possibility of presenting the topic as such, because that topic is uh, not painless at all. Uh, we consider it to be sometimes very sad and definitely nostalgic, because unfortunately uh, some uh, matebas uh, are covered with graffiti. Uh, the um, project has been developed or extended to include a project which at this point is in progress, it is in the pipeline. Uh, I am not doing that alone. I am working with Elżbieta Janicka. Uh, and uh, the uh, contemporary Warsaw is the topic. We have decided um, We have decided to perform a vivisection of a city with a tragic history. The, uh, we have decided to focus on uh, the city center of Warsaw, our photographic penetration. To be specific, we have decided to focus on that part of the city, which prior to World War II had been an informal Jewish district. A plethora of uh, Jews, of citizens of Jewish origin had been living there, whereas, um, the, as we well know, ghetto, a ghetto was established smack in the city center, which had then been liquidated as its inhabitants were murdered, annihilated. Uh, the ghetto uprising broke out on April the 19th, 1943, and uh, following the ghetto uprising, the ghetto territory or the part of the city with the ghetto had been annihilated, it had been burnt down, and uh, modern architecture had risen. Nevertheless, a number of pre-war relics have been set up and have been located a number of artifacts have been lo located and we decided to photograph um, to take bird's eye photographs of that particular area of uh, the area that had formerly housed the ghetto the jewish district we wanted to record the all the post-1945 urban development stages in the area and our experience tells us that we can discern the various periods because the uh, city planning concepts had varied not to mention the fact that we have high rises as well as well as several story buildings there uh, the project is in progress we are now working on it very intensely now with regard to the strategy of proceeding we are only going to have bird's eye shots of the area, nothing else. Usually those shots are taken from um, the 10th or 11th story level at least, from stairwells. And we are trying to take shots of the area of the uh, uh, traffic lines Hum, both human and vehicle traffic, but and we want to emphasize locations uh, that were typically Jewish. Uh, the Aryan corridor in the ghetto is exactly what you can see here. So we want to capture typically Jewish artifacts that can still be discerned. We do hope that the project will close with a book. We intend for the book to contain approximately 60 photographs. Nevertheless, a lot of things will happen in the meanwhile, and we will definitely modify or alter our approach given the nature of the topic that we have taken on board. Those photographs will be properly captioned. The uh, captions will contain information about what the uh, viewer 
can actually see, but also about what the viewer cannot see and what we can guess at on the base of certain symptoms visible in the shot and the frame. This marks a certain change in comparison with the projects that I had embarked on all by myself. In this case, uh, we are using the uh, four by five inch frame with a zoomed axle, which, uh, and this is a joint project with Elżbieta Janiska, and that gives us a, an option to skydive into the perspective from a large height. Tematycznie pojawiają się na blogu nowe miasto blogspot.com. Natomiast y, oczywiście y, przedsięwzięcie, oczywiście y, podstawowym elementem, który zakończy realizację tego, p, tego projektu, tak jak w przypadku rzeczy, które robię samodzielnie, będzie również publikacja książkowa, czyli ten materiał y, na bieżąco o charakterze archiwalnym przez nas stworzony zostanie również przez nas, przez nas samych ułożony w pewnego rodzaju, w pewnym, pewnego rodzaju porządku. Jeszcze dokładnie nie wiem, jak to będzie wyglądać, bo będzie to związane oczywiście z tym, jaki, jakimi zdjęciami będziemy dysponować. No i oczywiście... It will depend on the type of photos we have to work with and um, uh, part of the photographs will definitely be shown as a slideshow. We decided to use a large format of 4 by 5 inch uh, uh, camera and analog uh, technology now that everybody's uh, gone digital because we still, because negatives, the 4 by 5 um, inch negative uh, contains uh, so much information that when uh, processed online electronic digitally will allow us to do uh, our five by six feet uh, blow-ups uh, high um, that will be in focus and all these uh, things, all these uh, relics uh, will be visible. Maybe it's time for, maybe it's time we had some questions from the audience. There's one thing I'd like to ask about your synagogue project and the decision, a decision that you really failed to mention and something that was important for me when looking at the project, the decision on the choice of uh, former synagogues that you uh, photographed. Uh, these are buildings that are now in Poland and in uh, present-day Poland and not pre-war Poland. There's a difference, uh, the borders are changed, and I think that this is a brave, a radical uh, decision that uh, does not uh, uh, fall into sentimentalism. Well, yes, um, I decided to uh, shoot uh, all the um, places of worship uh, that are within the present borders of the Republic of Poland, of post-war Poland, because it is these buildings that uh, Polish uh, nationals are converted the way they did and uh, that's something I can relate to in some way I can feel complicit in and of course I f um, photographing uh, s former synagogues in Belarus or Ukraine some of which are very beautiful would of course would probably be considered ah uh, well it, the russians always uh, treat uh, things that way no i was interested in how us poles treat uh, heritage uh, what we as polish people over the decades uh, did how we treated the um, memory of our neighbors the jews who had been murdered during world war ii so that was relevant for me and if I understand the question uh, correctly, uh, this was a project uh, applying to concerning the here and now. It's not part of the former Polish borderlands. It's not sentimental. No, it was rather a case of uh, facing what we have here now and today. So exactly, maybe um, on the fringes of uh, Poland, on those parts of Poland that are now in Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, whatever. And uh, last year, 
uh, there was a very interesting album published, uh, The uh, Frontier, the Fringe uh, Regions of Poland, as uh, photographed by Andrew Kudowiczy. He's a uh, obscure photographer. He's a wrongly forgotten photographer. And this book does show a nostalgic, does present a nostalgic narrative of the um, lost um, part of the country, the part of Poland that was cut off from um, the country. And uh, the problem is that in the context of uh, Polish uh, pre-war photography, Henryk Poddemski is an excellent uh, modern uh, documentalist who doesn't have any pictorial and uh, his uh, photographs, uh, the photographs uh, taken from the eastern fringes, okay, uh, from pre-war eastern Poland are very modern. And in terms of uh, imaging, they uh, make me think of the best uh, photos by American uh, photographers who worked with uh, Stryker and uh, the FSA. A great photography, uh, and at the same time, it's uh, photography photographs that show all the ethnic minorities inhabiting that part of Poland, which is uh, which you would be hard put to find in uh, photographs by Polish pictorialists. lost in your work. In, uh, in the United States, there's been a, uh, a growing debate around the way in which uh, okay. in the United States, there's been a growing debate about the way that Detroit has become a kind of magnet, the go-to place for pictures of deindustrialization. And the reaction, um, which hasn't so much been from uh, professional critics, but has been there in the blogosphere, uh, has been quite hostile to the way in which Detroit has been uh, pictured. And to some extent, one could think of other, other cities like Polinari's work um, in, uh, after Katrina in New Orleans. And uh, this debate uh, among bloggers, uh, amateur bloggers who are now uh, mapping the, this invasion of Detroit, Detroit has has coined this um, this concept of uh, ruin porn, which is an, a quite an amazing concept uh, that is engaging me a lot. Trying to think about what it might what it might mean, and I'm struck that 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 you do everything to separate yourself from any possibility of falling within that category of ruin porn, even though I'm very uncertain as to what it might be. Uh, and that partly has to do with the very careful rhetoric of your images, but it also has to do with the, uh, the um, emotional relationship set up with the viewer, uh, which is where I would say that your work uh, um, separates itself from the work of the FSA or that kind of documentary tradition, which, is, which turns on the, a certain kind of structure of appeal to the viewer. And I would... Uh, associated much more with Evans's reticence and his his distancing of himself from from that whole tradition. So uh, that's not really a question, except I throw at you this uh, strange uh, concept of ruin porn and the way that it it uh, it characterizes the approach to deindustrialization in the United States. And I wondered if that sparked any thoughts. Uh, what you said is very interesting because I know I'm aware of at least uh, three projects about uh, Detroit. Uh, there's uh, two books uh, called The Ruins of Detroit. One of them's uh, very good, I'd say. Uh, they're both very good, and I didn't get the impression that this was ruin porn or uh, any other visual porn I was dealing with. I feel... I don't know exactly which... Uh, photographers of the uh, blogosphere was uh, going on about, but I, I'm i thinking about an interesting project by Jeff Browse called Discarded Landscape, uh, where, among others, uh, 
you also have Detroit, uh, residential Detroit, a rundown, abandoned uh, Detroit, and Detroit. And I felt I saw it as a critique of uh, an economic model that once manufacturing of a given product uh, ceases to be profitable, and when the factories are shut down, in this case the uh, automobile factories, the car factories, the entire social fabric shreds and uh, whole districts are run down in the new European model. Uh, it is not taking place in Upper Silesia, uh, even though the uh, factories the uh, were shut down. The uh, settlements uh, did not experience, or towns don't experience, uh, such degradation, even though some of them are beginning to resemble favelas. Uh, there's another thing uh, in connection with what you've said, the uh, ruins, that is. Uh, for me personally, because I also uh, did, I did black and white uh, photographs of former shutdown uh, factories that are collapsing. And I think that this is a classical motif in the visual arts. It's a it's a vanitas uh, motive. It's a vanitative motive on the um, fleeting nature of life and um, and uh, the uh, visual appeal of the photographs. Fine, they need to be uh, they need to appeal visually for the people to want to see them. So the uh, devices, anything that uh, is intended to draw uh, viewers, are most welcome. Are intentional. Oh, and thanks for the Evans uh, reference there. Bardzo mi się podobała ta prezentacja. Dziękuję. Odczułem jednak pewne napięcie pomiędzy trzeźwością ob zdjęć i archiwum, a takim katarzis, do którego o którym pan wspomniał w swoim komentarzu, jeżeli dobrze zrozumiałem, a wykorzystał pan słowo współwinny, padło słowo um, odpowiedzialny, współwinny. I jakby te a, zdjęcia były aktem odkupienia, pokuty, być to archiwum. Czy zechciałby pan trochę więcej na ten temat powiedzieć? Czyli innymi słowy, odczułem pewne napięcie pomiędzy a, trzeźwością to samego archiwum, a, a pewnego patosu odkupienia współwiny, coś takiego, o, który wynikał z tego, co pan mówił. Oczywiście, gdyby się tylko patrzyło na te zdjęcia, znaczy myślę, że można by odnieść nieco inne wrażenie. Oczywiście to prawda. Wprawdzie niektóre z tych synagog, byłych synagog, znajdowały się, znajdują się w złym stanie. Inne z nich a wyglądało to było normalne, że te gmachy są zasiedlane, są wykorzystywane, bo inaczej by po prostu popadły w ruinę. Ogólnie to bardziej uwaga niż pytanie z mojej strony, ale może zechciał. A... No więc jeśli chodzi o tę kwestię. As regards the, as regards the uh, redemption redemptive. Uh, I don't think that's really uh, the case that really holds. You can, uh, you might be dealing with a sense of guilt, as I sort of feel it, but uh, there is no cathartic element, nor will there ever, nor will there ever be. Uh, uh, because that's uh, unfeasible, that's not possible, because the uh, project was not uh, started, and not launched uh, for that purpose. It wasn't intended to uh, produce a sense of catharsis. That wasn't my intention. Um, the thing, the matter of settling uh, these uh, buildings, of people moving into these buildings, of course, uh, in Europe, uh, currently, given the withdrawal, the waning of religion, specifically Christianity, where you have churches which are being sold off and um, turned into apartment buildings, turned into clubs in Liverpool. For instance, I saw a, a neo-Gothic church uh, converted into a, a rock climbing or a climbing um, wall. But anyway, it's a different story here because in Poland, 
this is the tragic history of Polish Jews that we're talking about. Uh, um, a sizable part of the uh, Polish pre-war population, 10% of the population, and our attitude to these buildings, the way we treat them, also tells us uh, something about the way we remember these uh, former neighbors of ours. So given the tragic lot of um, Polish citizens of Jewish extraction, these uh, buildings uh, should be treated with greater tenderness and even the remodeled, adapted, converted, anyway, the converted buildings, many of them, uh, don't have any signs saying that this used to be a synagogue, but they do have commemorative plaques uh, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the Polish People's Republic, so-called Communist Poland. And these plaques are still there. There, there, could, be, there could be a third participant on this panel which would be a non-human uh, participant, which would be the camera, the photographic camera itself, if it could speak. And I, and I tell you why. The series of photographs we have seen first uh, was called There is Nothing Like the Innocent Eye, or... or hmm? Do you mean the black and white photographs or the uh, former? Um, uh, I there was, is I was, no such uh, thing as innocent okay. eye. Yeah, and I, especially after having seen a lot of your brilliant photographs, um, the, for example, the industrial ones, um, the, the camera lens would not make a difference whether this is at Detroit or in Upper Silesia or in the German Ruhrgebiet. And the, a photographer himself, um, Henry Fox Talbot, when he, when he invented his technique of te photography, as a painter, he celebrated that the photographic apparatus liberated him from the subjective eye. Now, how, how do you cope as a photographer with this radical dichotomy between the never innocent human eye, for sure, and the strict innocence of the photographic lens? <laughs> so you're referring here, and you're very vigilant and very uh, apt here to the title, which uh, is actually a quote. Uh, it's a quote uh, taken from a press review of a huge exhibition of uh, Polish documentary photographs called the New Documentalists. And in this review, the uh, show was uh, held five uh, years ago in the Center for Contemporary Art in Warsaw, uh, showing a new Polish uh, documentary photography, the first uh, showcase of this uh, photography in an art space. And the reviewer accused uh, the photographers showing their work that they did not address uh, social issues and uh, problems, that they're more interested in uh, making uh, it big in a professional uh, Western um, commercial photography. So generally producing uh, collector's items for sale. And I treated that as a challenge. And that's a digression uh, to explain the, uh, where the title came from. But the innocent eye, no such thing as the innocent eye, that phrase has to do with 18th century uh, visions, concepts of realism, which uh, challenge the objective nature of a realist uh, representation. Anybody who decides to uh, practice documentary photography and document uh, will eventually face 
So anybody who does so uh, consciously will eventually face will face this uh, dilemma uh, from the outset. Uh, we know that there is an element of uh, subjectivity present here. The object is the, the lens is innocent, and it uh, registers the Ruland or Upper Silesia in the same way. But the organization, the way the material thus recorded is uh, organized, is a function of the artist's, of the uh, photographer's uh, preferences, uh, certain cultural tendencies, and uh, obsession, which is uh, also important in art. Uh, some sort of obsession leads you to take up a given subject. And um, this tool, this app, the what Willem Flusser uh, called a device that has a range of possibilities uh, to photograph certain things. I would rather call it an instrument that allows one to obtain a far more richer um, statement. I'm sorry, I just lost track of was my train of thought. Uh, now, as I said, the lens is naturally innocent, in a sense, but it's also marked by a program, by the program of the camera itself, the uh, construction, the build of the camera. And so what I said about strategy, a consistent uh, strategy, and this uh, choice of instrument that we use is also very relevant because the camera is there to take a certain type of photographs, and we must consciously uh, make uh, use of that. We must uh, decide whether we want analog, digital, this lens or that lens with uh, these features or those features. I don't know if I answered your question entirely. A question to Yvonne Kush, a slightly... Mm, the previous uh, panel was called Archives of uh, Contentious uh, Stories. The archive looking awry and uh, disputed histories. So, uh, do you... So, what we saw just now, what uh, Wojciech Wilczek does and shows, it's called documentary for photography, but it's actually very similar. It's a very consistent process of documenting, archiving uh, specific conflicts uh, played out in specific time and space. In Silesia, these are uh, con conflicts or antagonism or of a social and economic nature and the way they're imprinted on the landscape. Life After Life, another series that you didn't show, is another story about transformation that's also more profoundly marked by uh, conflict and violence, memory wars. I'm not sure. I think that the projects are shown previously, at least for me, I'm just answering off the cuff here. They actually made me think they were a lesson on how to read existing photographs, an ethical lesson on how to treat existing archives. What Wojtek Wilczek does is a different. He creates archives. Of course, you have with the critical apparatus, and we showed a certain concept, a certain uh, how his approach to archiving is evolving, or at least uh, emerging. We agreed tentatively that the Silesian project did not uh, entirely um, render certain tension in the social fabric, but this is uh, not perhaps the place and time. I'm not sure, I wouldn't say we're living in a um, state of war uh, uh, when it comes to Polish-Jewish memory. Uh, and I try to say that when commenting on these photographs. Well, that's uh, maybe another story. But I'd see a gap here between the uh, tone, the temperature, uh, the tenor of uh, debate in or, and, and, and certain books and the actual space this uh, issue occupies in Polish culture. 
And can we actually talk of a conflict? I think uh, that's a term taken from another um, shelf, order of things, no matter how much we deal with it. But I think this analogy is uh, somewhat, is fairly uh, distant. And if anything might uh, serve as a uh, common feature here, it's the continuous uh, uh, demand requirement that we think critically. My intentions uh, with the project that you're looking at, or the Innocent Eye project, you could see it, and it's been read in this way, and it's been interpreted on a number of levels, and that's what I was striving for. Uh, it's a project about a very specific history, a tragic, uh, the tragical history of Polish Jews, but it's also a project about Polish uh, history, post-war history, uh, certain attitudes that uh, took root here, and uh, the most uh, universal approach, perhaps, uh, is that this is a project about the outcomes of all form, all racism, ethnic cleansing wherever it might take place. So the outcome of as uh, imprinted on architecture the landscape. Just two uh, remarks on the innocence of the lens. That's uh, not possible either because you uh, have different lenses to choose from. So is a 50 millimeter uh, wide angle more innocent uh, than another one? The uh, choice of uh, perspective of uh, optics um, is actually ideological or ontological. And in all of your photographs, this is very clear that you're adopting the medium range, not distorting. We have parallel lines. And uh, this is a choice. So there's no such thing as an innocent lens. Well, actually here, for the most part, we used a fairly wide angle lens, a 45 millimeter for medium format. And the whole idea, at least uh, when it comes to using lenses, was for one not to see distortion at first glance. But you use the op different optics depending on the position of the object in order to get uh, the right.